today we're going to be talking about uh, how to generate developer interest and activity. Uh, my name is Neil, and I'm a, well, a lot of people think I'm a, a platforms evangelist. I go around and I evangelize APIs. And I, I don't evangelize Mashery's stuff, like our, our whole SaaS management solution. I evangelize our clients' APIs. So we're talking about over 150 clients that we manage APIs for all around the world. So in terms of the evangelist gig, I, I have the best one possible because I have an API for everything. So a lot of people ask, well, what is developer outreach? Because they think of Mashery in terms of the SaaS solution, the security, the reporting, and all that stuff. So uh, well, first of all, I'm a developer at my, at my core, and I just love to solve problems, which kind of drew me to the company that has a boatload of APIs that they manage. And so um, as a, when I joined Mashery about a year ago, I, was, uh, I came on as, as an evangelist and uh, you know, slash hybrid with product. And kind of a, the dev outreach mission uh, is different from from the rest of the company. The rest of the our paying clients are platforms. Developers don't pay us anything, right? So, but we have a dedicated team that's just built for solving a de developer pain, and that's kind of one of our mantras. We want to solve developer pain. Another kind of cheesy thing I say is that I, I want to help build a, like a long-term meaningful relationship between the developer and the platform, right? So that's kind of, we're like matchmakers, if you will. We just kind of, we listen to developers, hear what their pains are, try to come up with ways to solve them. Sometimes we build tools just to solve that singular problem, and hopefully it, it'll have some, you know, long-term resonating value for the rest of Mashery and all of its clients. So that's kind of the background of what I do at Mashery. So the agenda, what we're going to be talking about uh, today, uh, first is preparing for um, increased developer ac activity. And it seems like uh, you might put that at the end of this preso, but I'll, I'll show you why uh, we're doing it at the very start. Getting to know your developer audience. Um, if you think that the people that are consuming your, your data or your services are just like you or your internal developers now, that's just not true. Maybe some of them will be just like you, but a lot of them will look at your data completely sideways, and I have some great examples of that, and they'll think of using it differently than you do, which is a good thing. Uh, the third thing we're going to talk about is showcasing developer activity. Um, I'll just get, that, get back to that later. Optimizing support and documentation. Uh, your current internal support organization you have for, uh, that's very informal, it addresses all of your internal needs, is not the same thing about, it's not the same the moment you invite outside developers to start consuming your stuff. It's, you need to think about it completely differently. They can't walk over to your desk and say, hey, dude, why isn't this not working? They, they're going to reach out in different ways, and you need to be prepared for that. Uh, and then documentation, which is one of my favorite topics uh, to talk about um, because documentation sounds so fun. Uh, five is engaging your community. And I talk about it in two ways, online and in real life, like in person. And it, those are two different things that kind of have the same goal. And accelerating adoption. That's a big thing like a, that, that we like to do at Mashery. Well, we, we think about how can we get a developer to engage with this thing because as I think that um, Chuck was talking about, Programmable Web has uh, 7,000 APIs in this directory, right? And they're not just a bunch of you know, open APIs. Some of these things are serious enterprise APIs. It's a very competitive atmosphere in terms of uh, the data you're competing against, uh, sorry, the companies you're competing against in your data arena. So you want to accelerate adoption so that you latch onto them and they never let go. Yeah, and you never let go of them either. First thing we'll talk about is preparing for increased developer activity. When I was preparing this deck, I, it sounded like, to put this at the very start, it's like putting the horse before the cart. But it's not quite like that. And preparation is not for preparing for something like this, you know, a Black Friday rush at your door. Everyone thinks at the moment that they have a brand new API or uh, they're, they're going to launch it, or even a new method or an update, that you're going to have people lining up to use it. Even if that was just one person, you want to be prepared for that, if, you know, a potential new partner. If you don't prepare, opening up your API is kind of something like opening up Pandora's box. Because if, you don't, if, if you're not prepared to handle even the most simple inbound request, uh, feature request, bug report, again, you're used to handling those internally. And if you don't get back to someone, they'll just, again, they'll walk over to your desk, shoot you an email, give you a call. If you don't do that, in, uh, if you're soliciting outside innovation or outside feedback and you're not prepared for it, it looks like that. And I've seen, I see it all the time. So preparation is a key word here. I asked a guy in the office, I'm like, I need like, some type of picture that encapsulates preparation. He's like, Rambo. So there it is. 
So what do you need to prepare for? You need to prepare for getting more input. Input that is <laughs> input that you think you want, input that is very constructive, and sometimes input that's not. So feature requests when it comes to APIs, I hear them all the time. Well, we get them all inbound at Mashery all the time. Our clients get them as well. And so if, let's say, for instance, on your API or product roadmap, because your API is a product, you classify things as nice-to-haves, right? Those P3s are kind of like, yeah, that, that would be really cool to have. That P3 to you is a P1 to a boatload of other people. And that thing that seems inconvenient for you, just, you know what, just too much technical debt to tackle to get to that, they don't care. That's a black box. They don't care what's happening behind the scenes. They just want it because it makes sense. Be prepared to handle that and not to blow them off. Right? The moment you open it up, you open up those channels, you open up Pandora's box, you're going to get that stuff. So just, you don't have to make everything a P0 and get it done right away, but you need to address that and be prepared for it. Bug reports and complaints. Um, when you create a new feature and you put it out there, you pray that your QA team is going to find every bug out there, and they probably do a pretty darn good job. They're not going to do as good as a job as you know, 160,000 anxious developers that get their hand on that thing. And the very first call they make to your API, they're going to be like, holy crap, it works like this? They'll get back to you, and they, will, they do not censor at all. There's no, their skin in the game is, I just need to solve my problem. It's not about politics internally, of like, well, I kind of know in order to fix this bug, we have to tackle all these other bugs. Again, they don't care. So you're going to get a lot of bugs, a lot of bug reports, and a lot of complaints. You just need to be prepared for that. And when I mean prepared, I mean, yeah, of course, technically prepared or just organizationally prepared, but even internally, like politically prepared. You need to prepare everyone for this. It's an, 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 an inevitability It's going to happen. Exposures on channels you don't control. So this is another part of the preparation. Social media and Q, uh, Q, uh, question, question and answer sites, or even public commenting services. So, um, you know, have you ever used Twitter to complain about something? You know, bad service on an airline, or even you, you just make a joke? Or ask a question on Stack Overflow, I, need, I have a problem with this, I need to get this thing done. That's you now. And if you have a platform, people are going to be asking those questions. And you need to be, be prepared to monitor those things. And you have exposure. You can win big by having so many people asking questions by just monitoring and answering those. Or you can lose. You can look like you're completely unresponsive, you're completely disconnected from the same community that you're trying to attract. Uh, onto your platform to begin with. So a lot of the things I'm going to talk about seem so like basic and fundamental. I call it, it's like a Warren Buffettism. It's just the fundamentals. Like his fundamentals of, inv of investing aren't sexy or cool. They're just what you have to do. And just, some of these things I just have to remind you. Because you do these things on the consumer side all the time. When I mean consumer side, not necessarily consuming APIs. Consumer side in, every, in, in, in any situation, whether, again, consumer of an airline ticket, consumer of a service. You moan and complain when things, don't, when things go south. Same thing's going to happen with your platform. So just be prepared for that. Getting to know your developer audience. When I first started this gig, I, I heard this idea that there were two types of developers. There was the open developer and the enterprise developer. And it drives me nuts because it, it doesn't exist. And what, so what I mean by getting to know your developer audience isn't that type of polarized classification. What I mean by that is um, you need to know like, who is developing on your platform, because that person that looked like that guy in that last slide, I mean, yeah, he's a startup guy. But I see guys like this at developer events and meetup events all the time that work in the enterprise. So you need to know who these people are. So how do you know who they are? You can use analytics. So you know, I didn't realize how much analytics were behind APIs until I joined. But if you know a little bit about the partner or the developer that's using uh, that's using your platform, you can look at every way and slice and dice every single way that they use your system, your API. And you need to know how they're doing it correctly, how they're doing it incorrectly, how they're doing it efficiently. If they're making 20 calls and they, they could be making one, that's kind of the analytics side of things. But there's this other part of it uh, that seems to be really important before someone launches, before someone comes to Mastery and launches, they always ask, well, out of your huge developer network, you know, how many are mobile developers? How many are you know, enterprise developers? How many do this in social? How many do this? And that's, like, that's a huge like, question at the very beginning. And then they launch their platform, and they, don't, they never ask that question again. 
And then, like, let's say a year or two later, when they're reevaluating things, they're like, damn, you know, who are these people? It's this, this really weird thing in between where they, all of a sudden they don't care because they're just trying to put out fires. Ask, you, you, can, you can find out more about this by just asking them. So you'll notice if you go to any developer portal at Menagerie, like if you went to like the, I don't know, developer.whatever-the-heck.com, uh, our clients have the options of asking very simple questions. What kind of developer are you? You know, uh, what platforms do you build on? Ask, because you know, it, to a developer, there's, there's an, they'll click the stuff and they'll be, um, they'll be honest with you about what they're, you know, what they're really proficient in in terms of the languages or platform. Just don't, you know, uh, you know, uh, fast track them. So they, I got to get them their API key right away. So they're going. Just pause for a moment. Ask them, who are you? What do you do? Why in the hell are you using this thing? You know, what is your purpose? But it doesn't stop there, and that's still something that uh, you need to do. You need to ping these people and ask them. Otherwise, you're never going to know. Analytics won't tell you the full story. You can try to trace back, like, oh, wait a second, they registered a new application. I might be able to classify that as mobile. If you go through all of that mess, why not just ask them? They'll tell you. I'm a developer. I, you know, the, the facts in front of you. I don't mind sharing that information about telling platforms how, you know, how I'm using it. Not just to complain, but you know, as a survey. This is another great question. What value are they getting? So you think that if you're a media company, the value that the developer is getting from me is they get the newest headlines, and they get, you know, they get the newest headline news, they get sports scores, or if I'm Rotten Tomatoes, they get you know, movie reviews, the freshest movie reviews out there. That's the obvious stuff. But again, <laughs> you have to ask them, like, what value are you getting? Meaning that, yeah, sure, that's the raw context of what you're sending me, but how are you using it in a way that it's valuable to you? Because it can't be the same. Otherwise, we just have a whole boatload of identical New York Times, Rotten Tomatoes, and Netflix. It's not like that. People use these things differently and drive value differently. Find out how they're using it and why they're using it. And this is another thing I, I like to talk about. What are, they, what are they contributing back? There are platforms out there where it's, it's kind of a one-way relationship. You just take, take, take as a developer, and you don't give anything back. You might have to pay a premium for it. And those are OK. And those, that happens a lot. But a great model for a great lasting platform, I think everyone should know this, it's bi-directional. Things, you you know, things that you do as a developer when you consume that API, you're pulling things down, feedback. It's like a feedback loop. And it, and it feeds it back into the system so that the platform gets value too. That's, you know, that's, I, I guess if you looked at social media sites, or platforms, of course, that seems intrinsic, right? Oh, yeah, I'm going to post something. I'm going to read something. But there's other things as well. You know, there's uh, in e-commerce, obviously. Even in media, you know, we have a way to track clicks and traffic from API calls. Like that type of like that's more passive feedback. But we track that stuff. That's valuable to know kind of how are you know how is the the person that's consuming it giving something back, even if they don't know they're giving it back. How do you, you know what's important to you and that's a real valuable part of a, of, a, of, a, of a lasting platform. Showcasing developer activity and innovations. So this is pretty basic. Feature what people are building. Why? Uh, it, makes the, it makes your partners feel good. It gives new partners or potential partners examples of what can be done. Right? So imagine I was, uh, we have a new client, Food Essentials. I think uh, someone had them on their deck up here. And it's food data. You know, over 75% of all UPC symbols in the US are food data. They have it indexed, and you can query it. It's fantastic. Um, but the moment, and it just launched. So the, but the moment that apps are, are, are starting to be made on this platform, they need to start showcasing that. Not, I mean, imagine for a moment your USA Today. They, they feature their own apps that they built on the iPad and the iPhone. And, um, but the moment that outside innovators start using your data, show off what else they're doing. Because it's, it, 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 it's, it's going to be interesting to the new people that are coming in that think, uh, well, yeah, this data is pretty plain. I can see. I, have an, I, I think I have an idea of how this stuff's being used. Uh, internal app stores uh, for users. So one of our clients, Clout, they have an app store. Hell, even at developer.mashery.com, we have an app store that features every app that we can find that's built on a Mashery API. And we, we, we categorize that. And I'll show that in a second. And another way to showcase is not necessarily in the App Store model, but the outbound messaging with blogging and Twitter and newsletter. This is probably the biggest Warren Buffettism ever, and I suffer from this badly. Just be a prolific blogger and talk about what the hell is happening with your platform. That generates more interest than you, than, than, uh, than you can do by just you know, doing it once a year or once a quarter. Don't do that. 
you know, anything you can talk about uh, around innovation, adoption, the silliest integration. It doesn't matter what it is. Just talk about it because that's the stuff that developers want to hear. It gives them examples of what to follow. Use Twitter. I, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you guys use Twitter here, but it's a great thing to use because people aren't, uh, they're not expecting a novella, right? It's 140 characters less. It takes you no second, no time at all to do it. So being a prolific Twitterer versus a prolific blogger, much easier. Newsletters. We send out newsletters on the, on, uh, on the developer outreach team every six weeks. And we talk about new platforms that have launched. We talk about uh, you know, interesting apps, great events we've, uh, great, uh, interesting apps that were developed, uh, events we were at, events where we're going. And we do it in a very timely manner. And it's, a, it's that audience that you have there uh, that is signed up for your platform, you have to ping them regularly. Otherwise, they just kind of forget you. So use that. You know, use the, use uh, email newsletters. Again, it sounds very basic and fundamental, but if you don't do these things, you're not really generating the amount of interest in your platform that you can. So this is an example of, a, uh, of over at, over at developer.clout.com. It's just a, a, a store that shows all these different apps that were built using their platform. In fact, I'm just going to hop over to my browser here. Hopefully this works. If you go to developer.mastery.com, we do the same. Uh, sorry about the uh, resolution there. Uh, if you go to developer.mastery.com, you click on apps. This is, this is just a way for us to showcase to, uh, to, to kind of give back to developers as well. We get a lot of people submitting their app and saying, hey, I just built this thing using the so-and-so API, the ESPN API. Uh, you know, we, have to, we dig around and find a lot ourselves because people don't know this thing exists. Um, but you just click through all of these. Um, you click through all, you know, all these different categories and see what people are building. It's interesting for the developer. A developer always wants to have, you know, to have credibility and show what the heck they're building. It's great for them. It's great for our, obviously, for the mastery clients, too. We want to show them that, hey, this, you, know, you probably weren't even aware, but we, you, there are a whole boatload of interesting apps that are being built on your platform. And of course, um, yeah. Nice. So uh, I'll, I'll move on. Optimizing uh, your support infrastructure and your documentation. So uh, this, this is probably the, this is outrageously important. So I'm going to uh, start with the, the key roles of the de developer support team. We work with startups that have three-person teams to Fortune 100s. And regardless of the size of your company and what resources you have to, to help support, uh, support your API, they kind of have to have a lot of, they have to have something in common. Uh, when it comes to uh, managing the developer community, you need a community leader. Someone who has a genuine interest in connecting with people, hearing what they have to say, knowing where the hell they are talking about your platform, and engaging with them. You just can't stick anyone on this one. Maybe you have to because that's the only team you have, but going forward, uh, so yeah, it's something you have to do even if you don't have the right person for it, but Thinking long term, you're going to get, want to get someone who, where that's something they enjoy. Because developers want to have someone that's listening to them, particularly if there's problems or uh, there's new features they want. They, they just need support. They want someone there. And when there's not someone leading that, it's very obvious. It's very obvious because it's very sporadic. You might post, uh, you know, someone might post a customer's uh, you know, a request for some help around the API. They may not get a response in 10 days. And all of a sudden, a day later, you know, in 10 days later, they ask a question, they'll get a response in five minutes because no one's leading the effort, no one's really measuring that stuff. So a community leader, a support agent, someone that can code and can answer the question and get in the weeds right away. With a startup, that's pretty much everyone. So everyone should be, you know, you know, should be pin, uh, pitching in this way. And then an evangelist. So in a, in a very small company, I don't recommend that people just go out and run out and hire an evangelist. You know, that's a very hot, you know, job term these days. I see them, I hear them all the time. But one of the, what to look for in evangelists is, is important. You want a guy, that, guy or a gal that can code. Not a marketing, not just a marketing person, right? Nothing wrong with marketing, but that's not going to solve a developer problem. It's just going to be that buffer between the problem, you know, hey, I have this issue, or, you know, I don't quite get this. Marketing person is going to look at them sideways like a German shepherd waiting for like, the ball to be thrown. They're just not going to be able to answer that question. And I've been there. I've been to events where I'm like, hey, I was at a hackathon uh, three weeks ago. It was three in the morning. It was a technical disrupt. 
and I asked a question of someone. I said, hey, I, we're having a hell of a time with this method. Could you help us out? And the guy's like, ugh. The evangelist left. I'm like, well, when's it going to be back? It was a huge cash prize up for this if you integrate their API, so I was really antsy. He said, oh, he'll be back here at 6 a.m. What the hell? <laughs> why, have the, why have the marketing guys stay there overnight? Have the guy that can answer the questions for the people that are staying overnight to work on this damn thing, right? Uh, I mean, valiant effort. They actually had some people there on the ground, but what to look for an evangelist is someone that can answer questions and wants to. You know, I, hell, I probably evangelize, 30% of my evangelism is for platforms that Mastery doesn't even touch. And for languages, I don't even know how to code in. But I'll get heads down just because I love it. I'm a geek, right? That's exciting to me. That's what to look for in evangelist, I think. You know, that's important. If you just kind of get a guy that says, yeah, I can talk in front of a crowd and blah, blah. No, that's not your guy or yeah. There's plenty of great people that can, you know, that have the skills to get in front of people and not throw up when they're talking. And code, right? There's, it's not that rare. Uh, they're out there. You just have, you have to be out there to find them. And you're not going to find that person <laughs> applying for an evangelist job. You're just going to run into them somewhere, right? Because I think everyone and their brother wants to be an evangelist. Documentation. Uh, I talk about this so much that it seems boring, but it, it's not. It, it still excites me to this day. Because documentation is what developers are consuming. That's, that's their customer service agent. When they want help, they don't pick up the phone. They don't write you an email. They go to your docs. So how, do the, how does that documentation represent your platform? Because if your documentation looks like this, resource one. Uh, in order to make this call, you would you know, hit this URI. Parameter one. Description of that parameter, parameter one. Parameter two. Description of that parameter, parameter two. Holy moly. I mean, if you, you laugh, but I know your life's smiling because you've seen it. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I just saw it the other day. You know, and I, I'll give the client some latitude because they just launched their portal, but I'm like, man, we can't come out of the gate with this stuff, right? Internally, I, they didn't have it parameter one, parameter two. They had like, you know, AAB, you know, an AAB. This is the AAB parameter. I'm like, good God. Internally, that means everything to them. They're like, oh, dude, it's the AAB. Even their close partners, it's the AAB. There's nothing, there's no question about what the hell that thing is. It's distilled down. It doesn't mean anything to me. I only know what the AAB was because I've been helping them implement this damn thing for, you know, for the past two weeks, right? But I can even make that mistake of just you know, saying, oh, that, well, it's the AAB. Um, don't do that because docs are like, that's the best friend or the worst enemy of a developer. Interactive docs. Um, last, about a year and a half ago, we launched, uh, we, we hacked some interactive docs project called uh, Mashery IO Docs. We, put, we built it in Node.js over a weekend. And um, it was kind of janky. It wasn't that good, great quality. But we threw it up on GitHub a few months later after we did a little bit of cleanup. Since then, uh, well, since then, we fully productized it. We baked it. We, you know, we refactored, recoded the whole thing in our, in our enterprise stack. So if you go to like developer.usatoday.com, you'll see interactive docs. Go to developer.espn.com, you'll see interactive docs. Hell, you go to developer.terapeak.com, a, a fairly new client, you'll see they have interactive docs. First, you know, I'm just talking about it and again. The assumption, you guys know what AAB is. I mean, the assumption is you know what the hell uh, interactive docs look like. Interactive docs are a way to uh, do the same thing that long form written documentation does, but give them a way to quickly get to where, where they want to go. So here is the TerraPeak API, uh, market uh, research data for pretty much every eBay sale that's ever taken place since the beginning. And you can get price research. Anything in bold is a required parameter. Anything that's not in bold is not required, right? If I signed in, which I won't do right now, uh, you, your key would automatically populate and you can make calls. Learning, this is how I like to learn. I don't like reading docs. I only go to docs when I'm feeling a lot of pain and I don't know what the hell's happening. Or if there's a problem that was just unexpected, then I'll go to the long form docs. So you need to have both. I'm not a proponent of having docs that are purely interactive and docs that are purely long form. Um, I'm going to, here's their long form docs. Actually quite nice, nicely organized. And a breakdown of everything. So um, what was the name of that, that method? That was the uh, query method on get price research. Uh, hell, let's pick anyone here. If you're using XML, this is what the input body example looks like. 
this. I got, I'm so happy you did this, uh, Turapik. Uh, every single field explained, right? There's no AAB crap in here. It is very specific. This is, they know what's going on. This is a great example. I typically go to eBay because they, that developer program has been around for eons. They have you know, droves of people on the docs team that keep that stuff up to date and version and accurate. But this is, a, this is fantastic. Um, this is, it's like I'm proud. <laughs> so that's, this is the long form documentation. But interactive docs, whole different animal that for, for a different type of person. The developer will use both. Just don't choose one or the other. It's just not a good idea. I think you need to have both. And just for, uh, for reference, um, of course, mastery clients get it for free. Or you can go to GitHub. We have our Node.js version uh, up on github.com slash mastery. I'll give you the URL after. OK. And really, by the way, interactive docs just kind of make sense, don't they? It's, a, it's an API. You know? I mean, making calls is kind of what it's all about. Pretty simple. Uh, engaging the community. So um, you know, it's about getting out there and proactively engaging uh, developers and not waiting for them to come. I know a lot of platforms that wait for people to come, and they think that, you know what, I have a good you know, 300 people using, you know, 300 partners or developers using this thing. That's good enough. Uh, no, I think that's not good enough. I think that you need to get out there and engage a new crowd all the time because they're going to tell you things and be honest with you or just give you a new perspective that you never had before. And you can do that online and you can do it um, offline in real life. So online uh, engagement for developers. Outbound communication, I covered this already. Using your blog and Twitter. Again, Warren Buffettism, just do it. It's a fundamental, you must. Inbound, now this is the back to the uh, original preparation um, slide I was talking about. Monitoring the QA sites like Stack Overflow, Quora, or even your own forum. So yeah, your forum might be on your developer portal. That's still an, it's still an inbound thing. We have clients that have forums. They never respond to questions. And it, I, a little piece of me dies inside every time that happens. Um, so don't let that happen. But monitoring these sites is kind of a pain. So uh, you, you know, with, if anyone here is familiar with Quora, I mean, everything's broken out by topic. You can monitor topics. You can monitor specific questions. You can monitor people. You know, heck, I, you know, I'll monitor our competitor just because the guy's a hyper Quora user. I know exactly where I need to go to set the truth straight about API management. Uh, community development. This is a big part of what we do at Developer Outreach, uh, where we kind of create tools. We don't create tools just for the hell of it. We create tools that solve developer pain. And we throw them up on GitHub, and we pray that people will rev on it, and they do. So the IO Docs project that we, uh, that we launched on GitHub at OzCon in 2011 has been forked probably 100 times, has you know, several hundred watchers. And the contributions that the community is giving back are scary. They're so awesome that I can't even merge in their commits because they're just so radical. And I love them. But when I meet them in person, I'm like, what can we do to work this stuff in? I mean, it's just so fantastic. That is, that, that's like the dream, right? Put a project out there, and people rev on it like mad, and it just makes it that much better. Now it's kind of a nightmare, because I don't know how in the hell to get those innovations back in. It's that, it, it's that aggressive. I love it. So that's engaging, uh, engaging developers online. And that's an abbreviated version of the community stuff. Um, there's a lot of value there, and hopefully I'll have time to, to give more examples of that. In real life, I put that in parentheses because I'm not sure how many people knew IRL. Events. So Mastery Developer Outreach, our team does like 100 events a year. Every weekend, there's something going on. And we travel all around the world, and we hit developer events. We have to be very choosy. So even though our small team can hit 100, 100 plus events in a year, um, not all. You know, there's probably about 20 times the number of events that we could go to if we had you know, 10 times it, you know, 10 or 20 times the size of the team. We just, we have to choose, and so do you. So that's a great question we get all the time. Where should I be? And how, truthfully, I don't know the answer unless I really dig in. I dig in for the context of mastery as a whole. Where can we get you know, best uh, re return on investment, which is just how can I get in front of developers? It's not about scale and size. It's about how can I have a conversation with these people? You need to be asking those types of questions, too. People think that if I go to a huge, huge hackathon where there's you know, 1,000 people, it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to rock it out. You're not. You're just not going to get that touch you need. So choose the right ones. Presenting at meetups is awesome. Um, yeah, there's not gonna, the, the meetups here in the city you could get north of 100, 150 people. 
It's not about the number of people. It's the type of people that are there and what you can give to them and what they'll give back to you. It's a very platform thing. It, that, that theme never goes away. You just you give, you take. So a meetup is a great venue. It's a great thing. You, people are getting together to talk about something they're passionate about that's probably kind of geeky if it's in tech. That's awesome. And they're going to accept you as a speaker. And you can go there and talk about your wares and hopefully solicit, solicit some feedback and, uh, and, again, deliver some value to them. Workshops. Workshops are kind of more like, I guess, more like this in a way, but not so much like this. More like you know, sitting down and computers open and people live coding around with each other. Right? That's, it's like pair programming with 10 people. Uh, but you, you're teaching them something. They're expecting to learn something. And you better listen, because you're going to learn something back when, people are, you know, well, when you're conducting a workshop. Hackathons. Maybe that's the wrong title for preparing for hackathons. So that, hackathons are kind of like, a, it's like the, the developer event du jour. Um, and there's, there's the general hackathon, with, like the TechCrunch Disrupt, uh, where it's kind of like, go ahead, let's show up and party. And let's, uh, it kind of looks like this. this uh, that was in New York on the, on the left, and then San Francisco on the right. 500 plus developers show up. A whole bunch of API sponsors show up. We get up there. We say, hey, please develop on our API, and blah, blah, blah. We stay there all night long. We help people. And it is. It's kind of like a party atmosphere. Um, and they're competing for prizes and whatnot. But really, the challenge there is, hey, build something. You might win some cash. You might get famous. And uh, the desire, really, at TechCrunch is to get in front of the judges. So you, know, you need to know, like, what's the developer mindset? Why are they even going to this thing? And then you know, the judges are typically at big you know, general hackathons. They're VCs, angel investors. You know, again, it's, it's kind of general. It's cool if that's who you want to get in front of. But it's a, it's a very, and, and, the, and the technorati, you know, the cool kids. That's who they want to pitch, pitch to. There's the vertical hackathon. And just the other weekend was the Hacking Health hackathon at UC Berkeley. Totally not like Disrupt. This is not a party. It was a two-day two day event. Um, you know, this was what was incredible. I think that developers were outnumbered by non-developers. It was like a four to one. Imagine that: four non-developers to one developer. Typically, that's an evangelist nightmare. How in the hell am I supposed to communicate to these people about something technical? But if you've been in the job long enough, you realize though that this is not. A, you know, APIs aren't really about technical. This is about solving a problem using someone else's resources. So, this is my bread and butter. I love vertical hackathons. They're cheap. They're small. They're domain experts. They're just not a bunch of people trying to be cool kids and getting in front of just you know, a whole bunch of you know, judges. To... There's great things that happen at those. But starting small, focused, this, kind of, this epitomizes that, a vertical hackathon. So there, this was the other weekend, Hacking Health at Berkeley. MDs, PhDs, the CTO of the hospital was there. People that, were just, that just know so much about this space were there. Those were the judges. Um, even though there was some quantified self, like Body Media was a sponsor, Genentech was a sponsor, even the apps were rated not necessarily by their coolness. It was like, well, what's the clinical value here? How are we helping patients communicate more clearly with the doctor and that we have some type of assurance that this information is secure, that this information is accurate? I mean, at hackathons, like, yeah, and I made this thing jump from over here to over here using a Connect, and you'll win a prize. That, well, actually, the Connect was using three hacks here at Berkeley, the Berkeley hack. But it's not about being cool. And I loved that. You know, the prize pool wasn't bad either. But that wasn't the draw. The draw was, uh, hey, I want to challenge, I want to solve the challenge of how I can help predict uh, influenza breakout in the Northern Hemisphere. Because we can do it really well, and you know we have a boatload of data, but we just can't do it in real time. That was one of Genentech's challenges. I mean, that's something. And it's not just about doing things for the greater good. It's just about you get to connect with people that are true domain experts, and they'll give you great feedback too for your platform. So uh, accelerating adoption. I don't know what the hell that was. So we have this thing at uh, at Mashery uh, that IO Docs was intended to to uh, to address. Five minutes to the first successful API call. So we have we can measure pretty much anything around activity around an API, and even developer activity. And one of the most troubling things that you can uh, you can read in a report is you have a bunch of people signing up and you know registering for keys or registering for accounts, and they never use it. They just don't. Why? My answer is probably because it was a pain in the ass to make the first call, and. That's usually true. They just didn't, they couldn't get there. So why would you let that fall off, right? You don't know who this person is. It could be a huge integrator. It could be, hell, it could be someone who wanted to acquire. You just don't know who this is. 
don't let them fail. So make them feel success in five minutes or less. And that's what something like the interactive docs do. So even if you had a complicated auth scheme, so Shal, he, uh, he demoed, inked it, and that was OAuth 2. OAuth 2, arguably easier than OAuth 1, but to, to go through that process in code, it's not, not, you, it's, not the, it's, not the, it's not rocket science, but it's kind of a pain. IO Docs completely abstracted that, right? You didn't, he didn't have to do the, all that, you know, he didn't have to program that OAuth dance to go back and forth. It just kind of happened in that documentation app of IO Docs. That, so that's, that's a complex, that's a very complex authentication scenario. We have ones in the middle where you need to sign it. You know, all this crazy uh, you know, signatures and algorithms you need to use for security reasons, IO Docs will handle something like that too. The idea here is that it's not, uh, it's a programmer's tool, but it's uh, to uh, get, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a documentation tool to get programmers to feel success as quickly as possible. I cannot stress that enough, right? I cannot stress that enough. There's a lot of new programming languages that come out, like, I'm not sure how many people here code, but uh, I mean, doing a hello world in a, in a language like Erlang or Objective-C is kind of a pain compared to, let's say, doing it in you know, another language. Because you know, early on, there weren't a lot of people that had examples on how to do that. that. That feeling of not being able to make a hello world app, which basically, if you don't program, that's the first thing you do when you learn a programming language. You just print on the screen, hello world. This is, uh, like, there's a term somebody coined, time to first hello world. It's time to first API call. Make it in five minutes or less. Learning by example. I pretty much have learned every language that I've ever learned, which I know a few, uh, quite a few, by example. I mean, I do have reference materials and docs, but almost invariably, I'll dig into someone else's code and, uh, and see how in the hell did they write this in its language. APIs are no different. So supply good code samples. God, you know, I hate even saying it, because again, it sounds so fundamental. Um, but you have to, and we hope, we try to get our clients to, to do this more often. And in fact, on the developer outreach team, we build sample apps just for the hell of it. Because while we're learning, we like to take that, and hopefully other people can learn from that. We'll throw it up on GitHub. App samples, full apps, you know? They're, I mean, you see them up on GitHub. You can actually search for an app in a particular language, and you can check it out. Do that for your, for your partners or developers, so they don't need to guess how in the hell do I go and come full circle and build something with this API? You have an example for them. And then interactive docs again. So uh, another thing about accelerating adoption are SDKs and just general tools. So uh, an SDK, a, a software development kit, is just a way to uh, make, to kind of bind your API into a native language. So if you heard, oh, it's the iOS SDK, that means I can use the, you know, this API, I, it kind of just, while I'm typing in Xcode, my editor, all of a sudden the methods just magically pop up and the parameters pop up and I can see like, you know, it's almost like documentation. It's like a, having a coding buddy. That's what SDKs help with. So executing a call, parsing out the results, all that stuff is just kind of baked into the SDK. That's great. You want to have something like that. It's a tough thing to build and maintain. Uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't do it. And, uh, or they think, hey, I have a RESTful API. They could just make calls to my RESTful API and everything's going to be great. That's true. But why not make it easier for those that don't want to construct HTTP requests, deal with the security and signature algorithms, deal with parsing? You know, if you bake that into an SDK, it's golden, right? I mean, you, they don't have to think about that stuff. And that's what you want. Even if they don't use that SDK in production because they want to roll their own, that's fine. But don't let them feel failure. Just tr you know, go for it. So on that, um, on that note, SDKs and tools you put out there um, that are open source, or maybe even if they're not. The idea here is that it kind of encourages community involvement. Um, you know, we put out tools, and like I, I told you about IO Docs and what a great success that has been in terms of just community involvement. Even SDKs can do that for you, because people are going to look look at your SDK and say, you know what, I you're missing this, or I don't like how this works. I'd like to make it better. That's gold. I mean, you can't pay for that. But they're doing it because they, they, they see the value in the API, but they also see the value in you investing your time and your energy into building tools that they can, they can use to make their lives easier, right? I mean, it seems like it just makes sense. Again, that whole platform meme, it doesn't go away. It just, everything about this, when you invest in a, in a, and when you think like a platform, you operate one, even at this level, not just the business level, but this, this level here, you'll, you're, 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 you're really gunning for success. Uh, I, that IO docs thing just can't, <laughs> I have like interactive docs in every slide. Uh, so on that note for SDKs, SDKs are a pain to author. If you go back and you talk to your tech guys and you say, why don't we have SDKs? They're gonna be like, because they're a pain. 
and who, you know, what army and how many and where's the blank check for me to write for the company to write our SDKs, and how are we going to maintain these things? So one of the ideas that we came up with at Mashri was IO wraps, which was you've taken so in order to get IO docs to work, you need to configure it with this JSON definition file. I won't bore you with it. But it's just a way to describe every one of your services. So when I, when I demoed the TerraPeak ones, those guys went through, and they just described it. And it probably took them an hour or two. Why not take that same definition and pump it through an engine that would spit out SDKs? right? So we, we created IO wraps. And IO wraps is, again, a derivative of an open source project that Google put out there called the Google APIs Client Library Generator. Because Google's got a boatload of APIs. right? And so it was a very, you know, very liberally licensed tool, uh, completely templatized. It's written in Python, but it can, you know, the templates are for uh, the ones that they support now are, uh, are Java and PHP. You'll see tests like experiments around C Sharp and iOS and so on and so forth. And the latest rev, which we haven't announced yet, we're gonna, is Python is something that they've, we have a standard template for as well. So you've already done as you know you've already configured uh, your um, your doc, your io docs or interactive documentation using io docs you have this definition done you just shove it through this piece of software and outcome sdks now it's not they're, they're machine generated so they're not they may not be perfect but what's beautiful about this in the community and developer community engagement part is that if the definition of the, of your apis was open the, uh, the engine that generates, that generates the SDKs is open. The templates that that engine uses are open. And then the SDKs themselves are open. There's, like, there's so many points of contact for which developer community and yourselves as a company have, that's like breaking bread over that thing. You have, it's, an, it's a conversation builder. And it's an accelerator. So it's a very wholesome thing to do uh, you know, in this process, I should say. Uh, that I believe, I mean, IODOX has been a fantastic success. I think that, in my, in my opinion, is that this will also, dis this is going to do more community building um, than even IODOX will, simply because it really does solve a developer pain and a need, and it solves a platform pain too. Nobody wants to write this stuff or maintain this stuff. Uh, and IO wraps, the idea of IO wraps kind of helps that, facilitate that and maintain it. Um, how to reward and incentivize developers? I mean, we, you see this in, uh, you know, earlier on they were talking about in, at internal hackathons as well as external hackathons about contests and prizes. Uh, hell, this weekend, at, at, it may be sold out, but you might want to check. The Health 2.0 Codeathon that's being hosted at our office. We're just the venue for the event. Um, we have a couple of our clients there that are sponsors, um, Aetna and Food Essentials. The, the, the prizes are at $10,000. Like, it's, that's crazy. And it's not going to be a huge event. Um, but it's a vertical thing. It's a, health, it's a health hackathon. So that does incentivize developers to check it out. I mean, otherwise, they're, I mean, you're swimming in a pool of you know, tons and tons of APIs. How can you set yourself apart? Yeah, you could throw a pony up some cash, <laughs> right? I've seen it, it can kind of get ridiculous and don't get sucked into it, but there's been hackathons where the cash prizes were north of $50,000 for a two-day event. I saw an 11th grade girl win, walk home with 11K over, you know, working on a little app she did, you know, over the, over the weekend with her mom. It's crazy. You don't have to go that route, but that's one way to think about how you can get people to turn their eyeballs towards your platform. We talked about, uh, you know, showcasing uh, innovations that are built on your platform. It's important. And um, you'll, if you go to several of our developer portals, you'll see, of our clients, you'll see that we're getting more and more of them to follow that pattern. And just partnerships. Um, you saw that in my title, partnerships. I, I'd like to think about working with other companies that build developer tools. I want to partner with them. I want to know how they're, you know, uh, you saw Red Foundry out there. That would be an ideal partner, right? They have this awesome tool to help build uh, beautiful mobile apps without having to be a rocket scientist. Um, and they look darn good. That would make sense for me to, hey, maybe I could have some template apps that use ESPNs, USA Todays, or Terrapeaks, or, you know, uh, Aetna's data. And those could be sample apps that we would bake into something like Red Foundry. Like that's an ideal partnership that you could do with other, you know, uh, developer efficiency tools and people that help solve developer pain. So it's, it's again, it's, it's kind of just diving into it. Don't look at the developer facing part as something that is either a burden to support or, um, you know, hey, you know, we have the people we need. It's a really, really, really rich initiative that has gobs of return on investment. And the investment doesn't necessarily have to be big dollars. It's just, it's just addressing the fundamentals, being prepared, and handling the inbounds properly, you know, the inbound support requests. It's just doing things that if you step into the developer's shoes 
and you really felt the pain that they feel, like awful documentation is one of the worst things in the world, uh, just that, you'd solve that for them. And so that's really was the theme today, was just how can you generate excitement and interest in your API? Just follow the fundamentals, get in their shoes, and I think that you'll, you'll be really successful by doing that. Thanks.